I'll write a hello world in C. Uh, you have to include the standard I.O. library. And then the entry point of every C program is a main function. So th this is a hello world program in C. No normally the way you uh, compile this is gcc hello.c. And you tell it what's the name of the executable file you want to generate. And I'll call it hello.bin. That's the binary file, right? Oh, okay. That's the ones and zeros. And then with the ones and zeros file, you can just call that file directly and your computer will run that program for you. So if you want to see the intermediate steps, well, I have this script called C to LL. So it takes your C and converts it into LL. Mm -hmm. And we're going to use the Clang compiler to do that. The Clang compiler coming from the LLVM project. So it's going to tell it to emit the code in LLVM code. There's actually a binary version of the LLVM code. And then, so yet another intermediate layer. And then we're going to disassemble it and print out the human readable version of the LLVM code. Uh, I'm just going to call this file on my hello.c program. So it's going to convert this C file into a hello.ll file. And this is what the LLVM code looks like. There's a lot of really busy looking stuff. I'm going to say this stuff don't matter that much. And this bottom stuff don't matter that much. And then here, this one is basically the printf function call. Okay. The string literal was defined up here. Uh, I know it looks super busy. I have an ll to asm file. If we take this ll file and convert it into assembly language looks like this. And then finally, it's going to take this file and turn it into the dot bin, the, the ones and zeros, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the pipeline. <laughs> I will show you a little bit of what the LLVM IR language is like. The smallest possible LLVM program you can write is this. You have to define a main function. Oh, you have to specify the type that the main function returns. Which what does this type mean? I32 means a 32-bit integer. Oh, uh, okay. I stands for integer and 32 stands for 32-bit. And, mm -hmm. and normally in C and C++, if you define a variable to be an int, it's assumed that it's 32 bits long. Oh, okay. And so saying, yeah, there's a main function, and by convention, the main function is always the entry point of the program, just like C. So they, they kind of took that convention from C. And then you need to return a value at the end of the main function, and you use this writ statement. Mm -hmm. This language very, very strictly typed, so it's very tedious to write code by hand. It's meant to be a generated code, right? Every single instruction you write, you have to specify the type of the arguments and type of the outputs. So here is right, I'm returning a thing of type I32 again, because yeah, that, that matches the output type of the function. So that makes sense. It, it checks out. And I'm just going to return a zero. So I'll compile it. I have a program called ll to bin. So compile this ll code to binary. Okay, so I compiled it, and now I have a play.bin. I can execute it. It does nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let, let's make it do a little bit of something. There's a function that's provided by the standard C library. It's called put char. In order to use it, I have to declare it. Uh, the fact that it will link it correctly, that's another thing. I don't totally understand how it works, but I just know that in order to use this put char function, which takes a character and prints it out into the terminal, I have to declare it like that correctly. And it takes a integer in 32 bits and it'll print it out. It returns another integer, but you don't really care about what that is in most cases. So I'm just gonna say like, yeah, if you wanna call a function, you say call, and then you have to tell LLVM what's the return type of the function. Even because, though even right. though it can kind of figure it out, like, but you still have to tell it <laughs> the return type. It's like, can't you just look over at the definition and figure it out? It's like, no, you have to tell me. So you have to you have to tell it the type of the input type, and then you put in the value that you want to print. And the value you're gonna put in is the ASCII code of the character you want to print. Oh. 
Oh, okay. Well, let's print A. That's code 65. So you put in 65. Uh, so if you run this, it's going to print out A. Yeah, it prints out A. And if you want to say, oh, I want a new line after that. Well, a new line is ASCII code 10. <laughs> okay. So it prints out an A and then a new line after it. Uh, so, so that's why my hollow world looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> this is my Hello World uh, program. It just prints out every character by the its ASCII code. A loop looks like this. You have to use labels and use this BR, which stands for branch. Use oh. the branch statement to jump from this place to that label again, which in assembly language, you do it in the exact same way. So this is just a construct from assembly language that it carried over here. Mm -hmm. I've made this program with a nested loop. <laughs> so there's a there's an outer loop and an inner loop. And then I have to have a block called n inner loop. So when it's done with the inner loop, I have to do this comparison. This I comp stands for integer comparison. So I, mm -hmm. I'm comparing the value of the loop variable to 10. If it goes up to 10, then I'm gonna branch to n either to the n of the inner loop or back to the top of the inner loop, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the same thing with the outer loop. So I have the same structure with the outer loop. So this is a nested loop. If you run this program. Uh, so it's basically like there is a pointer and then you just like find the block that you want to execute next. Yes. Uh, yeah. So th this is basically like the low level view of what an if statement or a while loop actually looks like. Interesting. Yeah, if, if, if you make a programming language, you need to make an if statement construct. You, you, you're going to need to do something like this. Mm -hmm. You have these labels, you have to plan out your labels <laughs> and have this, the end of this label go to that label and so forth. Uh -huh. If statement is similar to a loop because, mm -hmm. again, it's the linking together of the labels. You, you do a comparison. If it's true, you jump to one block. If it's false, you jump to a different block. And you have to plan out the blocks and put, put the code, the consequential code, into the correct blocks. And then when you reach the end of either the true block or the false block, then you join back together into this exit block. So you have to like have a return somewhere, like, and then you can get out of here. Uh, yeah. It, it's, this is a picture from the tutorial that I've been following. Basically, it's like this graph, right? This is the entry point of the if statement, and then it has the branch to one of these two nodes. At the end of the if statement, the two nodes have to join back to a common node at the end. That's the control flow graph. This is an add instruction, uh, and this is a subtract instruction, and you can assign variables, like sort of similar to what you would expect, but um, all variables in LLVM are immutable, it turns out. Mm -hmm. There's this concept called SSA, which stands for Static Single Assignment Form, which the LLVM language adheres to. So basically, uh, in static assignment form, every single variable can only be assigned to once. Which, which is nice for functional programming languages and immutable languages. But what do you do if you have a code that doesn't do that? Well, you have to rewrite the code in SSA form. And, and the way you do that is by each time you ass assign a value to the same variable, you actually have to make that variable a differently named variable. So like okay. you have to change the first one to Y1 and the second one to Y2. Mm -hmm. So they're actually two different variables. So, so, so basically you rewrite this program that doesn't satisfy SSA to this in order to satisfy SSA. Uh, why bother with SSA? Why is this important? Well, all of LLVM uses SSA. If you're generating code in LLVM IR, it has to be in SSA already. Mm -hmm. Why does it want that? Because if the code is in SSA, it allows for a variety of compiler optimizations. Oh, okay. Like there's a whole family of sort of well-researched compiler optimization. Mm -hmm. There's 
compiler experts that know how to do these optimizations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are either enhanced or made possible by SSA. Okay. So, so by putting this code in SSA, it enables LLVM to implement all of these different algorithms that can oh. make your code faster. That makes sense. Yeah, which, which is basically why LLVM mandates the code be in this form in the first place. So when you're... So, the, so the, if uh, you have Y1 and Y2, do they take up different like memory slot? Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, like, well, that's kind of weird. Like, what if you actually wanted to mutate variables? Um, you actually have to explicitly allocate memory is what you would do in that case. You, you say, hey, allocate memory for this variable, and then you store a value into that memory location and load a value out of the location explicitly in your, in your OLVM IR code. Oh, okay. Then this adds a complication though. Like it's actually not straightforward <laughs> to convert any arbitrary program to SSA form. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because as you can imagine, in this example, if you have an if statement, like right. stuff gets weird. So basically, if we have the code looking like this, we have first we assign five to X and then we assign X minus three to X. So that's clearly not SSA form, we just assign twice to X. That's not allowed. Um, and then also we have two separate assignments to Y. That's also oh. not allowed in SSA form, right? So, so if we convert this to SSA form, what would that look like? Well, it would look like uh, this, right? The first X is X1, the second X is X2. Now when we're comparing X to three, we want to use X2 because the, that was the last version of X that this program used. <laughs> and then uh, here we have an assignment to Y, we're gonna assign to Y2, but the next assignment to Y, we're assigning it to Y2. Y oh, the first one, Y1, the second one, Y2. Okay. And then here's the first assignment to W, we're gonna assign it to W1, uh, but then later on we assign to W again, so that's assigning to is W. Is that symbol on line 22? What is this symbol? Okay. That's not meant to be there yet, so let me remove it. The problem with encounter is here we have this statement that references y, but we don't know whether y needs to come from y1 or y2. Oh, it's a runtime value. Exactly, like, like it depends on which branch it took. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, uh, I don't know, I can't figure out which branch you took during compile time. Mm -hmm. So why, why is a question mark? I know it's either Y1 or Y2 that need to be referenced in here and in here, but that's mm -hmm. a question mark. Uh, and that's why we need the phi function. This is how they solve the problem. The, these compiler experts that came up with this concept, they solved it with this phi function that says, Oh, okay, phi is this chooser that will choose either Y1 or Y2 correctly. And it'll choose it based on whether you came from this branch or this branch. If you came from this branch, I'm using Y1. If you came from this branch, I'm using Y2. And I'll choose one of those value and call that Y3. And then the next step of the program can use Y3 after that. And essentially it's a merge Right, it, it, it's like we had to branch off but the, and then we have to merge, but we have to unify for this variable that kind of diverged in how it received the value. Oh, that, that's really strange. That's really strange that they had to come up with this thing. Basically, LLVM is saying like, I want you to give me code like this. I want you to give me this code that has this phi in it. And then I will compile this to machine code for you. Interesting. Yeah. So you have to write something to compile your code to this code. I mean, to uh, yes, wait. yes, yes. I have to generate code in SSA form, which is actually a non-trivial thing to do. And they, they say that in the tutorial. They're like, yeah, it's actually really hard to generate code in SSA form. So actually you won't have to do that, <laughs> fortunately. But in some cases where it's easy to do this, then this is what you should do. Okay. For pure functions, it's actually easy to do this. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the if statements for purely functional program language, it's like Haskell or Elm. Their if statement is like, if, you know, some conditional, then some value else, some other value. Mm -hmm. their, their, their if statement always have to have a then part plus an else part. You mm -hmm. cannot skip the else part. Mm -hmm. and, and also your, the if statement always returns you a value. Which, yeah. which, which means you, you can always assign it to something else, no matter what. The, the yeah. if, if statement is an expression that gives you a value. So basically you, you evaluate that expression to figure out what was that value. And you evaluate that expression to figure out what was that value. And that's the output value of the if expression. So it's easy to generate a fine note for that because you know there's only one variable that came out of this block and there's only one variable that came out of that block and those are the two values that the phi function is going to take in well as long as your language doesn't have functionality to reassign anything into it, anything exactly but if you have your language has mutation that's a different story and that's where you have to allocate memory and work with the memory explicitly i think that i've gone on probably for a pretty good amount of time. Okay. If you have other questions, I, I can try to answer. But otherwise, I, I think this is good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Is LLVM currently used in the, like, say, JavaScript compilers or other, like, popular C-like uh, programming languages compiler? Oh, okay. I don't think it's being used in the JavaScript compilers. Languages with compilers that use LLVM include action script <laughs> that's actually something i've used before um the action script is associated with flash which as you know died when steve jobs said we're not supporting flash on the ipad we have common lisp which used to be the most popular version of lisp mm -hmm. haskell yeah haskell has that objective c well clang already supports objective c mm -hmm. ruby I did not know Ruby used LLVM, but Russ, yeah, Russ is one that I heard was like, they, they use LLVM initially. Uh, Lua, Lua also uses it. I didn't talk about JIT, but JIT is like just in time compilation, mm -hmm. which, which means instead of running, running the compiler on the command line and then sort of spitting out machine code, you don't do mm -hmm. that ahead of time, you, you spit out the machine code while the program is running on demand. And JavaScript V8 kind of works like that. You just run the JavaScript and it'll read in the JavaScript code and parse it and so forth. And then when it needs to execute it, it'll generate the machine code right away, like in the browser. <laughs> well, because the browser is the program that's running everything. So the browser is like, okay, compile that to machine code just in time and then stick the machine code into this piece of memory. And then I'll put my program counter on that piece of memory and execute that code line by line. Um, and I, I imagine the dynamic programming languages like Ruby and JavaScript are doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the kind of thing I've been digging into. So for furthering my learning of, of compilers and programming languages. Yeah, that's very cool. That's like very helpful if you want to make your own programming language. Thanks very much for joining me. Cool, yeah, thanks for sharing.